So my name is Mike Hurley, and I'm one of the co-founders of Relay FM. In case you don't know who we are, we have around 30 hosts that produce all the great shows. Um, we started with five shows about a year ago, and we're up to 17 now. And these 17 shows are uh, downloaded over 1.5 million times a month, which I'm very proud of. We are only a year old, and as a co-founder, that is what I do every day. But maybe a little bit more importantly to me, I am a professional podcaster. That's what I do for a living. It's a dream that I've had for a bunch of years, and I'm going to talk about that dream to be my job this evening. That tweet is the tweet that I sent out just about a year ago about when I quit my job. But there is one little thing about this tweet, which I can never forget, which is that. I wrote that out like hours before I sent it. Like I read it back a bunch of times. I was like, this is gonna be so awesome. I'm gonna tell the world I quit my job today. But that haunts me now. <laughs> People don't let me forget it, but in a weird way, I'm kind of proud of it. So it was a big moment and a funny era, but it's now part of my personal brand. So <laughs> this evening, I want to talk about my journey, everything that has led me to stand right here. And the fact that this is one year after I became independent is really special to me. And I consider it a great honor to be here to talk to you all, not just because I'm on this stage, because I'm the first person to speak at the first release notes. And one of the things that maybe helped and made that feel worse was I was looking at some conference videos before doing this when I was planning. And I watched a talk that John Gruber did at Singleton, which was the last talk at the last Singleton. And he spoke about the honor of doing the first talk at the first one. And uh, I'm a bit scared. But anyway, I want to thank Joe and Charles for letting me be here. Um, and I also want to thank them for the banner so that banner that's outside, I saw that at WWDC, which made me do this. I was very excited to see my name on that. And also, do you see that t-shirt? That's our logo, always be branding. That is my first takeaway. <laughs> this is not my best facial expression. <laughs> but this, and there's no real reason I wanted to show you this. It just makes me happy. Uh, I just wanted to look at it again. But being here tonight is a great way to cap my first year. It's a great achievement for me. So this evening, I want to talk about some stories, a few stories about me getting to where I want to be and then some about me now that I am where I want to be as an independent podcaster. I created this series a while ago called Behind the App, and it's part of a show that I do called Inquisitive. And some of you may have heard it. I hope that you have. If you haven't, I actually think you'd all really enjoy it. It was 11 episodes that I broadcast over six months. It took about a year to make. And I interviewed a bunch of really talented and really cool developers. And we spoke about the challenges and the problems and the successes of being an independent app developer. And over this time, I feel like I got a real great challenge, uh, feeling of all the challenges that you have and the successes and, and all those things that it takes to build an app and be independent doing it. And whilst I was going through these conversations with people, it was kind of strange to me that I was able to draw a bunch of parallels between what you do and what I do. We're kind of linked that we're interested in the same things, but I'm in the same business, totally different type of business. But it was really interesting to me that I took some lessons, but I also feel like I have some things that I can tell you guys that might help you with your businesses. But first, I want to start with the beginning of my story. In 2006, I left college, and that's not university. In the UK, we have, you do like two years after you get your first qualification. So I was about 18 at the time. And I was going to go on to university and I was going to study English literature. And then I changed my mind and decided I wanted to do media instead. But I had to wait a year to do that. So I got a job for one year, which lasted for eight years. I got used to the money, didn't go back to university. And over this time, I always wanted to do something creative. Like I, I had a feeling in me like I wanted to be a person who had something to say on the internet not just in comments. And I tried blogging, and I had one of the worst URLs of all time, the applefanboy.co.uk. It was terrible. And as we've already seen, spelling isn't my strong point. 
So maybe blogging wasn't right for me, but I tried a bunch of different projects. They were on Squarespace, Build It Beautiful. <laughs> uh, none of these ideas really grabbed me. I tried a bunch of different ideas, a bunch of different sites, and this wasn't until 2010. I was on the phone with a friend of mine called Terry, and we were talking about Apple, which is what we did. Probably on that call, we were speculating about the North Carolina data center, because that was the style at the time. And we thought to ourselves, why don't we just record these calls? We talk about technology, we talk about Apple. This is what we do. This was the bus stop where we decided we would make a podcast together. I got on the bus and we spent the rest of the time discussing and plotting and scheming how we were going to do this, what we were going to call it, and all that kind of stuff. And on April 2010, on the 10th of April 2010, we published the first episode of, the, of a podcast with the first name ever. It was called The Bro Show. I don't know why. <laughs> we're not brothers, we were friends. I don't know why we did it. But as bad as that is, it's not as bad as the artwork that I made. Look at that. I don't know what that is. Now, I only have this in 300 by 300, because that was what you needed to be on the app store, uh, to be on the, uh, the podcast store at the time. That was like the maximum resolution you needed. And I hope that it wouldn't show up very well, but it kind of shows up better than I would have hoped it would. I considered remaking this for the presentation so it would be in a higher resolution, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. And basically every part of this artwork is stolen from Google image searches. Like I didn't make any of it, except for the title, which for some reason I thought should look like it was made on a label maker. <laughs> And I have no idea what the vibe I was going for, but it's not as bad as the music even, I think. If you listen, a sitar, why? Why did I do? The Bro Show was a great start though, because nobody listened to it. And that was really good because I got to learn some skills, right? So I got to take some time to learn how to do editing, to learn how to talk into a microphone. And then over time, we started to interview people, and I made loads of great friends. Pretty much everybody I work with now was somebody that I interviewed on that show a long, long time ago. The best ideas don't always come from where you might expect that they do. Like, I thought that blogging was what I wanted to do. That was the thing that I wanted to do for the rest of my life. But I didn't love it. I love podcasting. So I put the work in, I put the late nights in, and I still do. You might think that what you're working on right now isn't taking off. So you've got this project that you've been working on for a long time. It hasn't got the audience that you think it deserves. Like it's not getting the attention that you feel that it should have for all the work that you put into it. But what you're doing now will help inform your next project. And the next one. So those three shows, like they grew from each other. And they got bigger and bigger and they got better over time. They advanced, and I took the things that I learned from each one and applied it to the next. Not everything that you do needs to be a massive success. You might have an app that you're working on or a new app project that you're working on, and it's not where you want it to be. But the great thing is you can learn from all of them, and they're all part of your master plan. right? They're all part of the overall journey that you're going to go on. I have lost count of how many podcasts I've done. Like, it's double digit amounts of shows, like not episodes, like actual shows, like so many that I don't do anymore. And they've all helped me lead to where I am now. If you want to be independent, you have to do that. It's really important. I think everybody enjoys a good quitting story, so I want to tell you mine. But before I do, I need to let you know what happened between 2010 and 2014 when I quit my job, the day that I sent the terrible tweet. So I found the thing that I love to do, but at first it made me no money. None. And that was actually fine. I didn't mind that because I was like, one day I'm going to make money, and then it's going to be awesome. And then I made some money, which was actually kind of worse because it wasn't enough money. I made a little bit of money, not enough to quit my job. And the problem with that is like you get a taste for it. Because like in my mind, it was like, once I start making money, that's going to be awesome, and then I'm set. But like I started making money, and I didn't have enough money for three years. Like it, just, it just had to keep fighting at it. 
is so frustrating because if it makes money, you know it can and you believe in it, so you think it should make enough. But sometimes it just doesn't work like that. And it is really, really frustrating. So I spent four and a half years trying to make enough money. And the whole time, I'm still working my nine to five job at the bank. Like I had a real job, like I was a bank manager. Like I, run, I ran branches of banks for three years. I had teams of people. Like at one point I had 10 people that worked for me and I had to do performance reviews with them. I had to tell them off sometimes. I made a couple of people cry once, that was terrible. I really didn't want to, but they just wasn't listening. And I, I used to count money at the end of the day, like and put it in the safe which was strange. I sold mortgages to people. Like I had a job that a lot of people want to do. Like they want their careers to be that. But I had a big problem because I hated it. I really hated it. But the worst part was it made me feel sad. Like I waited to be laid off, but it never came. <laughs> I hope they'd fire me and it doesn't matter what I did, they wouldn't. And as time went on, like, I, I got depressed because I was trapped in a place that I didn't want to be. I was fighting for a dream that I thought was something that I should do, something that I could do, and it never came. But the big problem was my job was standing in the way. So I needed it because I needed the money that it gave me so I could do the things I wanted to do in my evenings. But at the same time, that job was taking my time up. So I was in this real scenario where I felt like I was kind of imprisoned by it, which is a really strange feeling. Like I knew I was good at what I did. Like I felt like I was good at podcasting. People who seemed to enjoy our shows and the numbers would, would go in in good places. And there were other people that made a living doing what I did. So why not me? Like what more did I have to do to get to the point where I could quit my job and do what I really wanted to do. I realized that the first thing that I had to do before I could do anything else was to get myself out of the rut that I'd gotten myself in. I was ruining my relationships and I was a bad employee because I got myself into a situation where it was just getting me down. Like There were times where I would go into the office and I would sit in a room and stare at a machine not doing anything for eight hours or I would go down to the basement and just walk around in circles, hoping that they wouldn't find me and that I wouldn't have to go and do the rest of my work that day. So the first thing that I realized I had to do was to get another job because I was clearly in a, a cycle that I couldn't get out of and it was just destroying me. So I got another job. I moved to the head office in one of these buildings. I can't tell you which one, you'll have to just guess. And I worked in marketing for another two years. So whilst I wasn't interested in advancing my career, and changing my career, I realized that I needed to get a better work-work balance. And this one helped. And I had a job that I didn't hate anymore. I didn't like it, but I didn't hate it. And I was able to separate myself from it when five o'clock came around. So during that time, I got my head down and I started working on things and decided that I wanted to do my own thing again. I wanted my own company and I wanted to try and push forward. So I started working night and day, including office hours. And I was sitting in front of a Windows PC every day, which was horrible. So I used my iPhone and my iPad to build a company. Like the apps that you guys build were the types of things that I was using every day to help achieve the dream that I wanted. On August the 18th, 2014, I worked from home that day because at 3 p.m. my time, we launched Relay FM. I woke up at 8 to get started on the job. It was horrible, man. I hate being in the UK. Like, I'm from London. I don't know if you guessed. Uh, so I have to, like, wait for everyone in America to wake up before I can do anything. Like, you guys, you kill me. So 10 a.m. Eastern time seems to be like the universally agreed upon time to do things. So uh, me and Stephen Hackett, my co-founder, sitting right there, uh, we were coordinating across the globe. We were sending iMessages. We were getting, well, this was when he woke up. Like I'm, I'm still awake for hours. I'll wait for him to wake up. He probably woke up at like 2 o'clock or something. 
we were like, we were really scared though. Like this was a terrifying day because we had no idea what was going to happen. Like stuff like that, like that's really nice to see like the iTunes banners, but you don't know they're going to, you know this, you don't know they're going to do it, right? You think they might do it. They've asked you for artwork and it's like, are you going to do anything? Well, maybe. No, they won't tell you. And so we were like, what if nobody's going to listen to our shows, right? We're taking a big gamble. Like we had some shows that we're building. We decided we want to go out and do it on our own again, and we wanted to make our own stuff. But what if we failed? What if nobody listened to us? That was the greatest day of my life. It was just incredible. Like, we had a reception that I never could have imagined. People were super excited. My day one journal that day is, like, packed. It was just fantastic. The thing was, after this, and we had some success, I knew I had to quit my job. October the 7th, 2014. That day really sucked. The department I was working in at the bank was falling apart. There was, everybody was arguing with each other. It was, we were under budgetary problems. It just, it, that day was just terrible. I was in fighting with people all day. And then in the evening, after work, I went to a funeral of a friend's grandmother like two weeks after my granddad died. I got home late that evening and I sat down on the stairs to take my shoes off. And I started undoing my shoelaces and realized that they were fraying and they were gonna snap, right? So I called upstairs to my mom and I said, can you get me some new shoelaces? Yes, I live at home still, uh, it's tough. Uh, but really, it's helped me buy a house, so that's awesome. <laughs> Uh, London's super expensive. Don't move to London. It's terrible. So my mom shouted back downstairs to me and she said to me, like, you don't need new shoelaces, you need new shoes. She was right. My shoes were dusty. Like, they weren't covered in dust, but they had that look about them where, like, you could start to see through the top layer of the leather. It was, it was bad. And I'd had them for, like, two or three years. Like, I remember that I wore them to the job interview for the marketing job, right? So I'd had them for two years. So I looked at them and I thought, if I buy new shoes, are they gonna last me another two years? Like these are shoes I only work, wear for work. Like if I go and buy new ones, will I have to wear them for another two years? That didn't feel like something I wanted to do. I didn't wanna be at my job for another two years. As a company at this point, like we're like a few weeks old, but we had good bookings for a quarter in sponsorship. Like I could see that I was going to be able to make enough money for at least three months. So I decided to quit because my shoelaces were fraying. They snapped a couple of weeks after. So I made my decision. It was kind of crazy, but I think that for a lot of people, this decision is made with a bunch of things building up to it. You just get that one thing that pushes you over the edge. And that was it for me, that my shoelaces were fraying. So I went upstairs and spoke to my mom about it because I, I wanted her to know what I wanted to do because I was about to take a big risk. And she told me, I'll never forget this, that this is the last chance you're gonna have to do this. Like this was the perfect storm, right? I've been working on this stuff for so long and it hadn't really got me where I wanted to be. But this thing, this Relay FM that we built looked like it could and I was still at the point where I didn't know my own home, I hadn't started a family yet, like this was the perfect time for me to do it. I spoke to my girlfriend, Adina, and she just didn't even hesitate. I think she was kind of just like, why haven't you done this already? She was 100% behind me, she was supporting me. And I spoke to Stephen. He's my business partner and my best friend. Like, he had to have a say in this. Like I was gonna put my livelihood in the hands of our business. Like, he had to be okay with this if we're going to do this. And he told me to go for it. I think Stephen was excited to see what I could do for us. When I was looking around for some stuff for this presentation, I was finding that horrible artwork and the terrible music, I was just doing some of searches, and I searched the word resignation on my Mac, and I found this file from November 2011. It was three years before I actually quit my job. I had written a resignation letter that was 855 words long, in which I wrote about every single problem with the company, 
all of the horrible managers that I had and told them why I thought that one day it would all burn to the ground. <laughs> and then three years later, in October 2014, on that night, on October 7th, I wrote another resignation letter that was 96 words long. I felt better. So I handed it into my boss the next day. She said words to me I can't repeat. And I spent the next four weeks wrapping things up. I'd finally done it. I listened to that song as I walked out of the door on the last day. <laughs> and had a reaction probably nobody's ever had whilst listening to that song. I was crying. Like, who cries listening to this song? But I did. It felt really good. It felt really good. And I promised myself I would never go back. So that brings us to now. So now I've been self-employed for a year and running a business at the same time, but a little bit longer. And what I've discovered is that nobody is born knowing how to run a business. There is so much stuff which nobody could ever know, which is why accountants and lawyers exist. Sorry, John. Uh, there is just so much that there is like, no way that you could know what to do. Like, who knows how to fill in tax paperwork or contracts and stuff like that? Like, you know, people still send me stuff. And I'm like, oh, this is new. And at least 50% of the talks that I've seen from independent creative people have a variation of this image. <laughs> the reason is because nobody has any idea. Like, just no one knows what they're doing. And when you work for a big company or a company of any size, really, there's like a chain of command, right? There's somebody who tells you what to do. They're accountable. You're accountable to them. They might, they have varying levels of competency, but they set you goals, they set you tasks, and it's simple. When you work for yourself, when you're an, you're an indie, there's only one person that can tell you what to do. It's you or your co-founder. And well, actually, I guess it kind of works a little bit different in the Apple development world. <laughs> Like, all of these people, they really have a say, I think. Uh, I've been thinking about indie development, right, leading up to this, and thinking about it with Behind the App. And it is a new business, right? So it's iOS app development. Like, the App Store changed everything. It changed everything for Mac developers. Like, it's just all different now. And having interviewed so many developers as part of Behind the App and enough of things that I've done over the years, I actually came to the realization that your business isn't unique. Like, I love you all, but you're not special snowflakes. But we have many of the same challenges in our business that you do in yours. They, we just come at them from different angles. And these problems exist in all kinds of businesses, right? And they have for a long time. So now I'm going to like spill my guts out on the stage and tell you about all the things that I worry about. Gatekeepers. So this was my favorite topic and behind the app, because everybody surprised me. Some people hated Apple, some people loved Apple. Some people wanted them to have less control, but some people wanted them to have more control. Like it felt like everybody had totally different experiences and feelings about their gatekeeper. Now, currently, we don't have one in podcasting, which makes us lucky, But because I've seen what YouTube is like with their content creators, and there's, it's just an incredibly hostile relationship on both sides. YouTube tells people what to do. The creators complain. YouTube says, I don't care, and makes them sign their contracts. And it's a real horrible, hostile relationship, because if you want to make videos, there's nowhere else you can go, right? You have to go to YouTube. Like, Apple is our biggest storefront, right? So they have the iTunes podcast store, they have the charts and stuff like that. But they have no say in what we do. They don't want to. They don't host anything. We just submit their, our feeds to them, and they just show them on their pages. And we also work great with third-party apps like Overcast and Pocketcast and Castro and many others. And they've been really pivotal to our success as well. But nobody controls it, which is great for us, because you have an unpredictable gatekeeper. You never know what Apple's going to do next. Our problem is it is unpredictable who will be ours. There will be one at some point or someone who's going to try and be that person in a really serious way 
And we have that to worry about because we don't know who they are and we don't know what they're going to want. This is how currently we make all of our money in advertising. It's where 100% of my income comes from advertising. It puts food on my table. But it's worrying. Like, what if nobody wants to advertise on podcasts anymore? Like, all of a sudden, everybody wakes up like, screw it. We'll go to TV instead. Or what if it turns into the industry like the web and all of the ads really suck? Or what if advertisers become disinterested in us and they just they spent all their money with us, they don't want to do it anymore? Or what if we have to turn to that gatekeeper to get metrics about our audiences? Like nobody wants that. We really don't want that. But that might have to be something we think about one day. Our industry could change around us and there's something we can do about it. And I know that some of you rely on advertising too. But again, it goes through your gatekeeper in a lot of instances. Whilst we don't sell our podcasts, there could be a day where we need to. And this is something that I struggle to think about because I don't know how I feel about potentially being in a situation where I have to decide how much money my work is worth, which is something that I, some, when thinking about this talk, it started to land with me how peculiar a feeling this is and how tough it must be to think about all of the years of work that you put into a project to put it down at a price at the end of it that people will buy it from. Like, I imagine like saying, oh, you have to pay 99 cents and then you can start downloading Inquisitive. It just seems weird to me because I work for hours a week on these things, hours and hours. And like, what are podcasts worth? Like, are they worth a penny? Like, if they are, that would make me sad. Right, so it's, and like, this is a real tough thing that I can't reconcile in my brain, and I have great respect for the fact that you can all do it. And then we have our customers, right? What if all our listeners went away tomorrow? Or maybe even more scarily, what if we just lost big chunks of them? Like, what if we lost 20% of our listeners tomorrow? Like, what does that do to our business? Where do our ads go? And we have charts, too, like you guys do. They look exactly the same. And we wonder what our positions are. And they're dominated by big companies with big budgets, but we are there. Looks pretty similar, right? Similar amount of apps. When I started doing this, those charts were full of shows like ours. Like that chart that I put up there of the podcast one, that was in the technology category. Like, because if I showed you the main category, we wouldn't be on it. Because our market now is massive and it's full of media organizations with huge budgets that we can't compete with. But now we found our niche and our niche really works for us. We've kind of carved out our place and we're happy with it. So I mentioned those things because I just want to give you the idea that I expect that I worry about a lot of the same things that you do. But it's not just us and you, right? It's not just these two businesses that have these problems. All businesses have those same problems. And over the next few days, you're going to be learning more about how to take your businesses further, right? How to make better businesses. Take all of this information in. My advice to you would be to not just think of it as a silo. You can learn from other industries. Like You might be able to take some lessons from record labels or libraries or bookstores or anything because all of these businesses solve their problems in their own ways. And the thing that you need or you might need could be in a business that you think might not be related to you, but they just solve their problems in different ways. One of the things that does make us different though, like you guys and what we do, is the way that we embrace the internet. Like we are all brought together over Twitter and Slack and iMessage. Like we build relationships with each other without having to extend our professional networks on LinkedIn. Like everybody that I work with now I met on the internet. With Twitter being a massively important part of that. Like it's 
hugely important in a really weird way that all of my current colleagues were people that I probably asked on Twitter if they would be on my podcast. And then we just built relationships that way. Like Federico Vatici of Max Stories. This is the DM conversation that me and him have when I asked him if he wanted to do a podcast with me, which led to me, Federico, and Steven starting the prompt together, which became Connected, which is now on Relay FM. Look at that, another spelling mistake. They're everywhere in all of my most important moments. So the internet sets us apart. This is the thing that we have that makes us different because we find our audiences that way, we find our colleagues that way. We grow our businesses without having to go to meetings and without ever having to go outside. So whilst I may not know exactly what I'm doing, I can now look back at the last year and the years that preceded it, see the mistakes that I've made, the lessons I've learned and the things that I wouldn't do again. But all of these experiences have led me to be a better business person, right? The last year of my life has been an incredible learning experience. I had to grow up this year because now I have people that rely on me every day to give them things. So it could be our listeners that want our shows or it could be our hosts that need my time and my attention. It could be our accountant could be our lawyer, like all of these people need me to do things. And every day there are things that I've never done before that I have to just do, because that's what it takes. That brings us to this part. The way that I tried to make money is not textbook, and I think this is the same for our company. Because sometimes we just do stuff that we think is cool. And then sometimes we worry about the money later. Like, that's my attitude. I just like to do the things that I want to do. And I feel like if I put my time into them, and if we put our energies in the right places, they'll make us money if they're good. Some things make me more money than other things, right? Some of my shows are more lucrative than others. But I love them all because they make me happy. And it's the balance of all of that stuff that levels out. I've always had side businesses, right? Which goes back all the way to the beginning. It was a side business of my real business. And I've always thought that way. That's how I work. So now I, I try and channel this idea into the way that I look at my business. So I have different shows, I have different focuses, and I look at different things in my business and try and spread my mind out in different ways. It keeps my personality engaged because that's how I like to work. Like we've had things that we thought would make us more money than we did, like behind the app. So it met all of our goals financially and listener-wise, the goals that we set out beforehand, but it cost way more to make than we thought it would. Every episode was about half an hour. It took me about 11 hours to make each of them, which was crazy. And I had no idea, and for some reason, didn't realize this until I already published the first episode. I probably should have planned that a little bit better. See, that's something I learned. But we kept doing it until it was done. It would have been way more sensible for our business if we did like three of them, because we never said how many we were going to do. But I finished it at a time when our business was relatively new, and I was putting like 11 hours a week into this, this one show. But I did take something extremely valuable from it. I learned some skills. So it didn't make me the money that I necessarily needed, but I took some skills, like editing skills, away from behind the app that have now made all of the shows that I do better. That's Relay FM this year. So this chart shows three different things. The growth of our shows, the growth of our downloads, and our revenue. It's all that. Bezos chart. That blue line sums up everything about us this year. I'm really proud of that blue line. We try to do things that make sense for us as a business. Money is important, especially now that Stephen quit his job for this as well. And we have loads of people that rely on us. 
But we approach things in a way that makes sense for us as a business. We don't do things solely because of the money that they might make us. That doesn't feel like the right path for me. And I'm sure that probably a lot of you feel the same. You just want to do the things that make your heart happy. And that's what we do. Like Our main thing as a company is to give people that we think are awesome a place to make great stuff. That's a wooden block that we have made to commemorate our first year. And we made them for all of our hosts and for people that had a meaningful impact on us as a business in our first year. We could have sent everybody an email to thank them, right? But this is the type of stuff that we believe in. So I look forward to my second year now of being indie. There's no way I wasn't going to put some Back to the Future slides in, right? Like you all expected this? Like, if this time is correct, like, Marty could be, like, outside now. <laughs> so what am I going to do differently in my second year? I need to address my work-life balance. Because this has really come along in the last year. And I need to think about some additional things in my life. I work maybe a little bit too much because I love to do it. But I need to start addressing some things a little bit differently. I need to think about the way that I scale my time and to make sure that I'm giving the right amount of time to the right parts of our business. Like this is something that I think about a lot. Like what can I do versus what other people can do for me? So do we need to find people that can help us do some stuff that take some things off my plate so I can put my time where it's needed? And also, I want to enjoy what I do more. I want to be more appreciative of the things that come my way which is why I put funny pictures of myself on the slides at the beginning, because I want to take more time to enjoy what I make. So as I reach the end of my talk this evening, like all good presentations should be, as I was told in my corporate job, you should sum up. The joke worked. It's silly, but that really works for me. Thank you so much. Please enjoy the rest of the conference.